Hey folks, my name is Colin. I'm an EM intensivist from University Hospitals Cleveland. And half my time is in the ED, half my time is in a cardiothoracic ICU, where I get to play around a lot with transvenous and epicardial pacers. And I'm here to tell you that these are actually pretty simple devices and are certainly within your skill set to place. Now, transvenous pacing, unfortunately, is a high acuity, low opportunity event. And if you remember from any kind of procedural advancement, you start not knowing what you don't know and being dangerous and progressing through volume and reflected practice, hopefully at the end of your training to competence. And then with more reps and more intent, you can get to mastery. But the difficulty is getting those reps with something like transvenous pacing. And the other concern is if you aren't intentional about practicing, either cognitively or physically hands-on with simulation, but through complacency, you can slip back down and become incompetent when it comes to these procedures. Now, you're all at recess X, so the complacency thing isn't something I'm worried about because you're here and you're listening to this. So I want to give you a quick primer on how to place a transvenous pacer. So first thing, when do we place this? Anytime there's an unstable radiorhythmia. The most common reasons in the emergency department will be a AV nodal blockade, either intrinsically in the form of a complete heart block or iatrogenically from an overdose of either a central acting calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker. Those are two of the more common indications. There are some folks who are having big time MIs, especially on the right side, with a new left or right bundle that may degrade to complete heart block and will benefit from one of these devices. There is a tachydysrhythmia that will be helpful to use a transunus pacer, and this would actually be torsades or a slow VT in folks with heart failure. You can actually overdrive pace with these devices and bring them back, but that's an advanced move. What are the contraindications? If they're dying, zero. But this does involve placing a central line, so any of the relative contraindications to placement of those probably makes sense. Also, you're going to be crossing the tricuspid valve, so if they had a fresh valve or a ring placed, maybe some folks would be a little reluctant. But at the end of the day, if the patient needs it, it's probably worth a try. Anytime you're doing a high acuity, low opportunity procedure, part of the complexity and part of the stress is where's the stuff? What's the kit lack like? You should know this before ever trying to place a transvenous pacer at your institution. This is my resuscitation bay. I know the second shelf up from the bottom all the way to the left is going to be the transvenous pacer kit and the pacer box. I know where it is, so I can tell somebody where to get it if we need to place one of these. You also should have a kit. There are a ton of proprietary kits available. You should use the one that your institution uses because that has all the stuff in it. You don't want to be racing around for constituent parts in an already stressful situation. So first things first, this is just the central line. Generally, when we're going to do any introduction of a intracardiac device, the right IJ is going to be the site of choice. Straight shot into the right atrium and the right ventricle to then pace this person. If for whatever reason the right IJ is out and they already have stuff there, the left subclavian is the next best site for placing these. Now I have on the picture a triple lumen catheter. That's not the one you're going to use to place. You're going to use an introducer catheter, and ideally the one that's in the kit. So the introducer catheters in the kits that we use are six French. It's a single dilator through the catheter with a single dilation step. This is different than the serial dilations needed for a triple lumen or an IHD line. Now, can you use a MAC or a larger cordis introducer catheter to place a transvenous spacer? You sure can, but there's going to be a lot of venous bleed back through that larger port. So use the catheter in the kit and place it in the right IJ and you're on your way. You're all competent, I hope, hopefully experts at central access. Once it's in, now comes some of the idiosyncrasies of actually floating the pacer. Before we even float the pacer, remember eighth grade health class and always use a condom. Now, that's a bit provocative, but you need the sterile sheath on the pacer to actually manipulate this sterilely and actually longitudinally after you've placed it. When I go to the ICU, we have these sheets and some of these pacers become malpositioned. And if we don't have a sterile way of manipulating them, a big increase in infection. So always use a condom for the complete sterility on the sheath. 
I wish I've only made this mistake once, but I've probably done it three or four times. And then I have to take out and replace the pacer entirely. So now you've placed your introducer catheter, you've put on the sterile condom, and you've advanced your transvenous pacer to about 15 centimeters. Now it's time to hook it up to the box. There are going to be two transducer pins that you put into the ventricular output of your box. And now we're going to set up the box. What we do is called honey badger pacing mode. And this is actually from Joe Belezzo, but I think it's wonderful. You want the rate to be at least twice that of what their innate rate is. I set it at about 80. The output should be maximal for your box. For the box that we use, it's 25 milliamps, and this should be in asynchronous mode. If that seems like a lot to remember, especially in the din and clamor of a resuscitation, we've made it easy for you. The Medtronic box has this red DOO that if you just press that, it turns on the pacer and then defaults to these settings, 80 paces per minute, 25 ventricular output in an asynchronous mode. Now you're ready to pace anything. You have the pacer on, it's connected. Now we're going to float. The balloon goes up. There's only about 1.5 cc's. You blow it up and you're going to advance steadily. Between 30 and 40 centimeters, you should start seeing a ventricular injury pattern. You'll see it as a STEMI or an OMI. You can see this just on your bedside telemetry. You don't need any special monitoring. This means you have the pacer contact contacting the right ventricle and you should be getting electrical capture. However, the goal of transvenous pacing is not electrical capture, but mechanical capture. We actually want to improve cardiac output and improve perfusion at our distal beds. You can actually see this in a bunch of ways. The most reliable non-invasive way is with your pulse ox monitor. This reliably should show pulsatility with a good waveform at what your rate set at around 80. If you have an arterial line as part of your resuscitation, you'll also be able to see it on the waveform there. Lastly, you can also float in real time and see mechanical capture on your echo. If you're able to do all this, you have mechanical capture and the patient should be doing a lot better. Now that you have mechanical capture, we should dial back that output. We started at 25, but we need to dance it back down to something that's going to be a bit more durable for the long term. Most folks actually will capture less than five milliamps, but we need to do this sequentially. 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, 3, 2, 1. And ideally, somewhere between 1 and 3, you're going to lose mechanical capture. That's your threshold. What I do is I then double that. So if it's 3, I double it to 6. Have the patient cough, make sure that connection is stable. And then I'll set it box right next to the ear. So there's going to be no way that it gets pulled out. And you're on your way. Over time, that threshold, that capture threshold will go up as there's fibrosis on the end of the pacer. So it's good to know at what threshold capture you're starting at. So what are some pitfalls? One is failure to capture in the first place. This is usually due to two issues. One, the circuit isn't complete between the pacer box and the pacer. If that's the case, look at the pacer, look at the pins connecting to the ventricular output, and then make sure your pacer box is on and in that honey badger DOO mode. If that is actually on and working, you're probably not in the RV. Generally speaking, you should be in the RV at 30 to 40 centimeters. And if you're not able to achieve this blind, it's time for a dynamic visualization. I do transthoracic echo. I think the sub xiphoid is a wonderful view to see that RV. And you're able to see this actually go into the RV. Now, if patient positioning is a problem, Putting them in the left lateral decubitus will raise and allow the buoyancy to go into the RV and the right-sided structures. If both those things fail, you can always use the poor man's fluoro of repeated single-shot portable x-rays to see where your balloon is in real time. Another pitfall is I can't get it out of the RA. It's just coiling in the right atrium, especially folks with AFib with big dilated atria. The plan here is to come back to 15 centimeters do about 180 twist on your pacer, left lateral decubitus again, and try to get into the RV and look for that injury path. So that was a brief overview of transvenous pacing. It's simple. It's just an introducer catheter, ideally in the right IJ. Remember the sterile sheath so we can manipulate it after insertion. 
Remember Honey Badger pacing mode, 80 and 25, but all you have to hit is the emergency or that red deal button to get there. For electrical capture, look for a STEMI or an OMI pattern. And then for mechanical capture, let's look at pulsatility at a distal bed. A pulse ox waveform in A-line or physically seeing the ventricles contract on echo during real time at your given rate will mean that it's been placed. Transient is facing, it's simple, and you can do it.